Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first broadcast of Ferment TV. I'm Kim McDonnell, and I lead special projects at Ginkgo Bioworks. I'm the creator of Ginkgo Ferment and the product director of Ferment TV. Ferment TV is an experimental space for virtual gatherings by Ginkgo Bioworks in partnership with London-based agency Faber Futures. We're featuring multimedia storytelling from the world of synthetic biology. We're foregrounding emerging ideas from some of the world's leading scientists, designers, industry leaders, artists, and thinkers at the intersection of biology, technology, and society. In 2018, I launched Ginkgo Ferment, our annual in-person meeting, with the intention of activating an ecosystem of scientists, investors, consumer brands, collaborators, and more to engage in open dialogue about the synthetic biology revolution and its impacts on the world. This year, worry not, we'll still be holding ferment number three, but we've decided not to wait until the, aut uh, till the autumn to start the conversation. Right now, we're living in a world that's upended by biology, but we're also living in one that relies on biology to solve the problem. Science is happening in real time all around the world, and we believe it's important to foster the larger conversation in reaction to this global experimentation. COVID-19 has revealed the systemic connections between science and technology and the environment. So now is the time to reimagine what futures lie ahead in a post-pandemic world. We need to broaden our understanding of how science and innovation interact with the ways we wish to live, take care of one another, and become better stewards of this planet. The other great thing about going virtual is that we can be much more inclusive. So traditionally our events have been bottlenecked by things like venue size. So now we're really excited to expand the conversation to our community and beyond. Ferment TV going forward will feature a series of live broadcasts every Wednesday that will be moderated by Ginkgo's creative director, Christina Agapakis and founder and CEO of Faber Futures, Nasai Audrey Cheza. So before we officially begin and hand it over to our speakers, I have a few housekeeping notes. The first is that this session is being recorded, um, primarily so that we can share it online afterward, so that you can view it, you can share it with others. Um, and we're also looking forward to some great questions. So please share them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And together, we'll explore them in the last 20 minutes of this session. And I, I must thank you in advance for your patience as we learn the ropes of virtual event production. And in that same vein, we're very excited by building this unique, unique community. So we'd love your feedback. Um, we'll be sending a quick survey following this session and we'd encourage you to please be brutal. <laughs> and now finally, today we launch our first broadcast of Ferment TV with Visions for Biotech 2030. How we act now determines 2030. And in response to COVID-19, what we're seeing is that there are fundamental decisions to be made. With an eye toward 2030, what can and should we be doing now? With that, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, Dr. Megan Palmer and Lisa K. Solomon, in conversation with Christina Agapakis. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Kit, and, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Megan Palmer and Lisa K. Solomon. Uh, I'll do a brief intro and then we're just going to dive right in. Um, all right, so Lisa K. Solomon is a speaker, author, and educator focused on helping leaders learn how to be more creative, flexible, and resilient in the face of increasing complexity and change. She's currently a designer in residence at Stanford University's Institute for Design, and she's also the founding chair of Transformational Practices and Leadership at Singularity University, a Silicon Valley think tank and business incubator. Lisa's work focuses on developing, teaching, and amplifying the skills, mindsets, and behaviors required to lead positive change. And then Megan Palmer is the executive director of biopolicy and leadership initiatives in Stanford University's Department of Bioengineering. And she's also an affiliated researcher at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford. Dr. Palmer leads integrated research, teaching, and engagement programs to explore how biological science and engineering is shaping our societies and to guide innovation to serve public interest. She works closely both with groups across the university and around the world with stakeholders in academia, government, industry, and civil society. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to dive right in by starting with a questions about uh, our title that we have today. The title is Visions for Biotech in 2030. I'll start with you, Megan. Um, why do you would you say that it's important for us to cultivate more and different visions for the future of biotechnology? Thanks so much for having me today. It's such a pleasure to be here. And for me, um, it's pretty simple on why we need to cultivate more and different visions for the future. People want and value different things. And I think we often don't spend enough time articulating what exactly we want and, and why. Uh, we don't often spend the time to explore what I think are often more commonalities than differences when it comes to that, that big why. And I, I think while we often spend a lot of our energy on the politics in other areas of life, we often don't think about the politics of the technologies and the knowledge that we're creating. Um, but the reality is that thinking about the future is really hard. <laughs> it takes time and practice to both uncover and negotiate the futures. And, but I think when we can be more explicit about the conversations um, or in the conversations we have about the future, both about what's possible and what's preferred, we build the more solid foundation for the societies that can really serve everyone. And how the this technology is developed and deployed will determine who benefits and who's put at risk, um, who's going to control the biology that we're made of. <laughs> um, because biology is an important technology and it's crucial that we ask these questions again and again. Oh, Christina, we can't hear you. Sorry, I muted myself because I was typing a note, but now I'm not going to do that again. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I think for on the other side, so Lisa, you spend a lot of time thinking about visions and helping people cultivate them. I'm curious actually for your perspective on biotech. Uh, I know you recently co-taught a course with Drew Endy. Uh, why do you see biotech as something that's interesting or important for us to be engaging with? I know Megan touched on that a little. Can you, can you give us a sense of what, what you're interested in with biotech? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And second of all, I love the title that you called it Visions for Biotech 2030, not Vision. And I think that's really important. And Megan already started to talk about it. It's one of the many reasons why I love learning with Megan and being in conversation. Because as Megan talked about, it's, uh, it's actually hard to think about mul multiple futures. Uh, that's actually a skill where we haven't been cultivated. And, um, and I spend my time thinking about how do we help more leaders develop the skill set to envision a multiplicity of futures so that they are thoughtful when they bring about they try to bring about their preferred future. They're thoughtful about their strategy and their investment. And so, Christine, to your question about why am I interested in biotech, I mean, full disclosure right up front, I am not a biotech expert. However, it is hard to imagine a future without biotech being a critical part of it. And this was something I was exposed to a few years ago during my time at Singularity when I got to understand where the exponential future of biotech was headed. When you start to appreciate that biology DNA is going to be the next code where we can actually learn to write that code, we can edit that code, and you start to think about where does that code exist? It exists everywhere. Then you start to realize that biotech is everybody's future. And so everybody needs to be more aware of how it is playing out. And just to build on another point that Megan said, that is not the same for everybody. My preferred future around how, how biotech might enable more equity, more access to basic needs may not be the same as somebody else's. So who gets to decide? Who gets to be a part of those investments? So that's really what's fueling my interest, which is those strategic questions that say we are at really just the beginning of seeing the massive impact of where this is going to go. And I think it's important that many more people are involved in the conversation. That's awesome. I think, um, I know, I mean, I've known Megan for a really long time and I, I know that th those are similar questions to what Megan has been really interested in. And, and she's, you spent so many years like trying to kind of create those spaces where people can be thinking about that. Like, what does it mean to have a more equitable future? How can we bring more people into part of that conversation? Um, so yeah, so Megan, in that decade that you sp spent building those spaces for people to have those skills and tools for thinking about those futures and the ways that synthetic biology can serve the public interest, uh, maybe you can share some examples of, of 
of how organizations can be actually designed from the outset um, to enable some kind of those, some of those conversations. Yeah, thanks, Christine. It's, it's hard to believe that it's been, in many ways, over a decade. <laughs> many of these uh, conversations and, and projects started uh, really back in, in grad school and, and even before for me. Um, and maybe I thought I, I would share a few examples of the types of organizations I've worked with as a foundation. And I can talk about some of the, the lessons that were learned, um, often the hard way, uh, from those experiments. Um, so actually, way back in grad school at, at MIT, I ended up working with a number of groups, including um, groups like the Technology and Culture Forum and the Science Policy Initiative, um, including with some of the initial communities envisioning what we now recognize as synthetic biology, asking the question of what does a synthetic society look like? What does that even mean? Um, how do we begin to anticipate those futures? And, and then that led um, after grad school to being invited um, to uh, co-direct initially with Drew Endy and, and Ken Oy um, later on the uh, policy and practices component of uh, a large investment from the National Science Foundation uh, to form the Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center, which was across many universities. I think at the end of the 10-year multi-million dollar investment, it, it involved more than 40 groups and um, in labs and 40 companies. Um, and then through that, came to lead about a decade now of safety and social responsibility related programs with the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which I think involved uh, 6,000 uh, participants last year across 360 teams and uh, at least four dozen countries um, and programs um, accompanying that like LEAP, which is a mid and early career professional program for those who, who had a vision and a point of view for what they thought biotechnology could accomplish. And then for the last five years, I've been involved in a policy institute, um, working with social scientists and humanists around key problems in international security, um, and recently rejoined the bioengineering department at Stanford to lead a new uh, cross-university and really beyond university initiative. And so all of these different um, real organizational experiments involved different assumptions about how to structure work in these areas, um, who should be involved, how to actually do it. And so I, I think I'd probably take three main lessons. Um, the first is that you actually do have to structure the organization um, to give um, power to different types of expertise and interests. Um, so the National Science Foundation with Sinberg, I think, did a really exceptional thing by making this part and parcel of a science and engineering center and involving social scientists to look at safety and security, governance questions. Um, and it began uh, about 25% of the portfolio by the end of that period of time. That being said, these were hard lessons in that um, many times that generated uncomfortable knowledge and different types of viewpoints that led to rejection or reprioritization. And so it, it was a lesson for me, you have to empower those voices from the outset. Um, the second one is pretty simple but hard to do, which is you have to create the space, time, and actual communities of practice that are asking these hard questions. And I think we learned that through programs like LEAP and through iGEM, that it is about keeping each other accountable <laughs> um, and, and actually taking the time to re-question your assumptions. We have lots of blinders. And so we'll, we need those communities. Um, and then last thing is just we need to support and celebrate this work. Too often we think we can have conversations about ethics and governance over a pizza lunch, and it just takes more than that. <laughs> so we need to actually fund the work, support the people, and then also um, iGEM is a good example of celebrating, right? Celebrating people who um, get things wrong <laughs> and who change their course um, in, in, um, in projects and, and really are actively asking, is this the, the most important thing that I can do with my valuable time? That's awesome. I, I think it's so interesting. You, you, you said um, in the, your first answer, you were talking about sort of the politics of knowledge. Um, and then you sort of brought up this idea of like uncomfortable knowledge. Um, and then and then like, how do we sort of make sure that we 
have the time and the space and the expertise to kind of like articulate that and, and, and dig into it. Um, it makes me think, so, so Lisa, like in your work, I think you, I know, think a lot about how to design and lead some of those kinds of conversations. Like how do we bring those people to the table? Um, and, and how do we kind of sit with that discomfort when, of challenging our own assumptions and, and figuring out how to bridge some of those gaps? Um, I wanted to kind of also hear from you and kind of jumping off from what Megan was saying, like how do people do that, right? Like what are the things that we can all learn uh, from, from your work? And, and yeah, what can we bring maybe to, to our next Zoom meeting uh, that's, that's gonna be right after this? Oh gosh, Christina, isn't that the work to be done? Um, <laughs> I so appreciate Megan calling out those through areas around how to structure the work for the organization. How do you build communities of practice? How do you celebrate and learn along the way? Notice that none of those are how do you develop expertise in the lab? Now that mm -hmm. is super, super important to understand the technical expertise, but to understand the interdisciplinary discovery that can happen when you actually ask interesting questions about how that knowledge in the lab, how the technical possibilities might actually play out in society Society, that's a very, very different skill set. And that's very much what fueled my, the first book that I wrote called Moments of Impact, How to Design Strategic Conversations to Accelerate Change. This was based on many years of scenario planning work, essentially designing conversations about the future that I had the wonderful opportunity to do at a fabulous firm called Global Business Network, which was really just this incredible network of remarkable thinkers and questioners. And what it taught me was that the practice of designing conversations about discovery is actually a leadership skill we are not taught. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's the opening chapter of the book. The most important leadership skill you've not been taught. I mean, let's just pause and think about it. I don't think anyone on this call or anyone in this field can say with certainty exactly how the future of biotech is gonna play out. We don't know. And anyone that says with certainty that they know is someone that I think you should question a little bit. But that doesn't mean it's unknowable. It just means we need to think very intentionally about how we're going to explore those possibilities. That happens through conversation. And not just any conversation, not like the meetings we're taught to run where you're on a strict agenda and your number one goal is to end on time or get to next steps. I mean, I think everyone on this uh, webinar and, and the TV show at the moment can appreciate Oftentimes when you say we're going into this really important meeting and say, what's the number one goal? Get to decisions, get to next steps. So we rush to decisions before we really even understand what it is we're deciding on. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that practice of living in the ambiguity, of framing questions, of encouraging multiple perspectives to come to the table, to share their expertise in service of co-creation, in service of sparking imagination is a skill, it's a discipline. And we're asked to be masters at this thing that we have not yet had time to practice. So that's, Christina, you asked earlier about my class that I uh, co-taught this past uh, winter with Drew Endy and Megan was a wonderful guest, a like shining guest in our class. Uh, the essence of this class, which is called Inventing the Future, is to expose students to these practices that allow them to imagine what the future might look like so that they can start to be more uh, thoughtful about who needs to be a part of that conversation now so mm -hmm. that we can get to that preferred future versus a future that's happening to us. So a big, big part was to realize, wow, it's not just about the tech and it's not even the question of can we build it? It's really an exploration of should we build it? And in order to have that conversation of should we build it, you need to be thoughtful about who you're inviting in from the very beginning and how you're encouraging them to share their point of view. That's so interesting. I, I, I love this idea of like being really like um, making space for asking questions um, and, and also like help, helping people learn how to ask better questions. Um, it seems that often, right, like I, I was trained as a scientist too and th this idea of like, uh, what your hypotheses might be, right? Like we are trained to kind of think in, in, in that in, in terms of those kinds of questions. Um, but we're, we're rarely taught to kind of uh, question our assumptions about like what the problem is that we're trying to solve in the first place, right? Or, or you know, we're not really trained to like, yeah, bring in the social scientists to ask about those questions, right? Like, or, or the people who are experiencing something, right? We, we don't have those 
skills. And so, uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, just to say like, that's really interesting, right? Like the, this question of like, what is it? What is it we're trying to solve? And how do we even like ask better or different questions? I think it is so important. And what, I, I mean, one thing just to, just to build on that, sorry, Megan, and love yeah. to your thoughts is like, it's interesting for everyone on the call right now to even just like pause and say, how, do, how would I feel if I was asked to host a conversation that I wasn't sure I could get to a solid answer to? How would I feel? How would I know I'm really thinking more broadly about it? And so again, we're asked to, to, to lean into something that we haven't had time to develop the skill set for. And it's, I just, I want to just give a huge like nod to Megan and all of the choices she made and try, she's made in trying to bring about organizational change that shapes the future takes this leadership stance. And I think mm -hmm. that's so, so important. I, maybe just to add on to that, one of the things, even though we are trained as scientists and engineers to have these hypotheses and point of view, it, it's important to remember that we've become actually pretty committed to those point of view, <laughs> points of view and those <laughs> hypotheses. And so one of the things we learned through programs um, like the, the LEAP Fellowship was that this is not professional. It is also very personal. Um, because we end up really committing and shaping our identities and our views and our, and our, and our own politics around really wanting those futures to be true. And so we guard against those assumptions. Um, and so I, I think this comes back to the space. We need to create space where it's okay to say, um, I was wrong or I hadn't thought about that um, and foster a, a real growth mindset when it comes to um, what might be possible. Um, beyond our initial, our initial sets of, of assumptions. And notice, Megan, just building on that, notice what would happen if you said, I wonder how we would learn more about that, right? So all yeah. of a sudden now you turn it into a generative question that others can get on board with. And I think, Christina, that's an opportunity for this moment in time for us to realize we don't know the answers, but that doesn't mean we're without agency. We have the opportunity to ask questions that allow us to take the next step and learn. And so I think mm -hmm. this is a huge opportunity for organizations really to take learning very seriously, not because it's a nice thing to do or because it's sort of the, um, the HR compliant thing to do, but because it's a strategic thing to do. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that the learning organizations are going to be the resilient organizations. They are going to be the ones that come to a new opportunity faster. And so it's a huge opportunity to say, where does learning sit within our strategic um, portfolio priorities? And how do we make sure that that learning includes our processes of how we learn and our network of experts? Yeah. And one of the things I've really enjoyed about working with Lisa and the D School at Stanford is the idea that th these are skills and tools that can be learned. I have had some great conversations with Lisa about meetings I've wanted to host or activities we've wanted to build. And Lisa's taught me so much to say, well, what, what do you really want out of this conversation? Is it about making decisions? Is it about questioning goals? Is it building community? And the idea that you can often do one or two in one meeting and maybe not all at once and, and really breaking down um, that. And I even have a I have an educational social psychologist who's in my group as well at Stanford, um, who brings a whole another set of tools around education and pedagogy and learning. Um, and, um, and it's been real just a, a fun and real joy <laughs> um, to, to learn these new, new skills and apply them in, within different communities. I had a question. Uh, Lisa, you mentioned sort of this, um, that sort of feeling of uncertainty of like, well, how do you even know that these are the right questions? Um, and and I think that's maybe something that that is worth kind of digging into and unpacking a little bit, because I think that is something that was, I mean, it was certainly hard for me as a scientist, right? Or I think engineers, like, there is a right answer usually, or like there could be. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, what, how do you uh, sort of like cope with and like, yeah, then, then kind of move forward when, when you can't quite know what is right, right? Like that, that maybe, I wouldn't say it's sort of like that maybe when there are questions of sort of like ethics or other things, right, there, there probably isn't a right answer, um, but there's a answer that you have to choose. Um, so, so sort of how do you know, how do you start evaluating those and, and how do you deal with it? Oh my gosh, Christina, that's like the heart of so much of the work that we do, which is practicing navigating ambiguity. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think just a couple things I'll say about how uncomfortable it is to go after something knowing that there may not be a right answer or we may not know what that right answer is and we're asked to take that next step anyway. I think for one, it's important to know, like as humans, we love certainty. Like that's what's kept us alive. Is there a lion around the corner or not? So our brain is wired for that clarity. Okay, so that's part one. Part two is pretty much, I, don't know, I know you have a very international audience here, but certainly the schooling that I've been a part of and now I spend a lot of my time in K-12, most of the primary education systems are geared towards right answers, knowable things that you can measure quickly. So pretty much from the age of eight on, you know, we start to uh, socialize to our young leaders that what matters and what's valued is getting to a right answer. So all of a sudden that beautiful imagination that a four or five year old will have to ask any question and imagine any story slowly gets socialized out of them. So there, that's the part two. So one, we're neurologically wired to like certainty. Two, most of our foundational years actually get the imagination and the comfort with like holding these crazy ideas. We don't value them. And then three, most of our systems are oriented towards like pretending that there's a known answer. I mean, just think about how organizations rely on strategic plans, which are like, okay, if we just hit this, this happens. And we know we're certainly living in the moment of it that the future doesn't care about your strategic plan. The future is going to unfold <laughs> yeah. in a way the future is going to unfold. Uh -huh. And then our leaders are caught flat-footed, okay? So, so all this is to say, Christine, that a big part of the work that we do at the D School, which is an interdisciplinary, experiential, leadership, really um, research institute, right, where we learn together. And I say research and that our research is like done through practice is about exposing uh, leaders of, of all ages to um, creative problem solving. You know, this notion of building creative confidence to say, this is an important, challenging topic. I don't know if there's gonna be an answer to it, but I'm gonna take the next step to actually learn how. So part of it gets back to what Megan talked about earlier around a growth mindset. Can we be okay with a starting with a question that we don't necessarily know is the right question, but we're gonna take the next step anyway? How do we know? How do we develop more evidence gathering skills that's outside of the lab? The social science skills of seeing what is actually creating value for people or not. I think the thing that's a little tricky with biotech is that you know, we're, we're asking these hypothetical questions before we can actually see the evidence because the technology may not be developed fully or may not be mm -hmm. allocated fully. So we have to make some guesses. So I'll just end this answer by saying one of the things we do in our class, Inventing the Future, is that we practice these practices every week. So every week with the students, we introduce a creativity practice and a futures practice to get more comfortable asking the questions we don't yet know we need to ask. So just one quick example of that is early on, we introduce them to something called the futures wheel, where we take an observable trend, something, hey, you know, let's talk about what's the future of biotech. Um, and we, uh, we put it in the center, we, we sort of, and then we start to say, well, what would happen next? And what would happen next? And what would happen next? And we create this very fluid map without judgment by just asking the question, what would happen next? And all of a sudden you get this huge tapestry of possibilities. So we don't pause early enough to kind of ask those bigger questions to then step back and reflect and say, what are the interesting threads that we should be following more closely? Where should we be gathering research? So I think you know, one of the biggest surprises that happens in our class is our students say at the end, you know, I used to think that thinking about the future was like a skill that was innate or excuse me, a talent that was innate to only a select few. And now I know it's a discipline. Now I know there are tools that I can rely on. So I think we have to socialize that sense of agency more, that skill set more. And that really drives a lot of my work. I think I want to pick up um, one okay. point that Lisa yeah. said really quickly, which is the idea of multiple types of evidence. So even though we may think about all these areas of, of uncertainty and ambiguity, if we both build on those futures and then take the, the time, right? It's not one point in time you're considering those futures, but you revisit and say yeah. that what, what next, <laughs> you know, a few years from now, or maybe a few weeks from now, given the pace of change, saying, 
what what were the indicators that this was true or not? Um, and and it's that real iterative improvement, the idea that you can't do it just once, you have to do it ongoing, you have to bake it in um, over time. And and there is an accumulation of evidence and knowledge from other areas, and we need to get comfortable with with how to recognize that and also realize that we, we're not going to do it alone, right? We need other types of people <laughs> who have, um, who are experts in their, in their own capacities um, for looking at different types of, of work. I, I wanted to ask a question, like when, when you're thinking about the, um, about the future um, and, so, and sort of like uh, I, I know, Lisa, I heard you when we ran our prep call, you said something like, you know, utopia and dystopia are, are tools for thinking about that future. Um, and I know that they've definitely, they shape the sort of discussion that's happening sort of like within the technological disciplines, but also in like pop culture, in, in policymaking spheres. Uh, maybe this is a question for you, Megan. Like, I, I know you've been, yeah, you've been engaging with policymakers and, and every, with so many people about, you know, those possible like positive futures, but also potential risks and, and kind of more dystopic scenarios that people can imagine when it comes to synthetic biology. Um, so I, I'm curious, like how you both think of those kinds of stories or, or potential futures as tools, uh, but also like how, how they shape the way that we understand what this technology is and what it should be. Sure, I can, I can start off here. Um, yeah. You know, I, I sometimes worry about the overuse of utopian and dystopia, uh, utopian and dystopic futures, um, because they can lead to polarization um, of points of view, but at the same time, they do open up our frames. They open up our points of view. And it is a practice if we wield it carefully <laughs> that can be useful, um, especially because I think often we are good at painting, or better at painting dystopias than we are at utopias, or we sometimes hold these at the same time, like biology is going to simultaneously save and destroy the world, um, and we don't separate out the two. Um, and most recently, um, I found that the use of, um, of these utopic and, and dystopic futures that that Lisa and others have used in their class was, was particularly useful. Um, in, uh, in early March, I, I testified in the Senate um, about the future of bio leadership and what that looks like and what it, what it entails. And so it was useful for me to convey what are really the stakes here? What are the possibilities? How do we imagine that there are many different futures and they all matter? Um, and so I used um, that tool, partially learning from Lisa's class, <laughs> um, to say, you know, what are the futures we might want and, and what are the futures we might not? And I think we're in a moment now, given um, what's happening with a small piece of biology upending our world, um, as Kit introduced at the beginning, where there are potential large shifts in which types of frames we apply to biology, right? It's mm -hmm. right now we're thinking biology is out to kill us, right? <laughs> it is um, uh, as power for harm or at least for uh, disorientation and um, and disruption, perhaps not in a in a good sense. And um, and then we have to remember that that we have the capacity to to act as agents in shaping a different type of, of view um, and partnership with biology, where we can secure ourselves against biological threats, right? We don't want a future in which we are constantly afraid um, and made vulnerable through, through biology. Um, we can build the types of tools and infrastructure um, and communities that can look into the horizon and say, this isn't the last threat. <laughs> um, they will be many, they will be different. Um, but also if we begin then by going beyond just mitigating threats, right? And we say that, that if we are to realize biology's potential, there are many things that are possible, right? It has, um, it has implications for the security of the supply chains of our, um, of our food, the materials that we use. Um, and also that it is not just something useful, but it's um, awesome in the most literal sense, right? It is 
It is an awesome technology that is beautiful and bold. <laughs> um, and by creating the space to imagine that we have a different relationship with biology, um, not just different uses of biology, then we can allow the space for different communities to have a say. Um, and so I think, you know, these tools, like others, can be used constructively or destructively um, to prioritize different viewpoints, um, but they certainly do have a, a, a place for shifting our, our thinking. Yeah, I mean, that was so beautifully said, Megan, and, and, I, and I very much appreciated, Christina, how you framed it. They, they are tools. The utopian stories that we tell, the dystopian stories, they're tools for conversation. They're tools for taking things that are abstract and trying to concretize them in some ways that we can understand and we can relate to. Because when told well, they have elements in these utopian and dystopian that are familiar to us. So we can find ourselves perhaps in them, but we can also remove ourselves from the anchor of what's known and the here and now and suspend uh, belief for a minute to allow ourselves to go to a different place. And what we did in our class, we actually used them as practice. So as I mentioned earlier, we introduced two practices every week. And then starting the third week of class, we divide the group up into teams and they start to create these 50 year utopian and dystopian futures based on emerging technologies, not to get it right, but to explore how these tools help them build out these worlds in different ways. And one small um, important thing that we do in our class to maximize learning is that after the, the student debates talk about, you know, one case, the, the future of lab grown meat, the 50 year utopian and dystopian. So we make it very concrete for them. And they really, in order to do well, they have to have narrative and they have to have personas and stakeholders and they create an environment. And after they present their either utopian or dystopian, instead of having the team tell the other why they're wrong, they reflect on what they found interesting, what was surprising, what did they learn from it? And so what we're trying to do is groove this listening skill for patterns, for recognition, for something to be amazed by through the lens of discovery. Um, and then what we do is we have an expert and uh, Megan was, as I mentioned, a wonderful mesmerizing and enlightening expert in, in one of our classes on syn synthetic biology that talks about, well, what is the current state of technology and what are the things that they are paying attention to? So again, I, I agree that utopian and dystopian can be um, uh, used for harm or can oversimplify the complexity of what might be. But when used through the lens of conversation, through the lens of teaching, through the lens of discovery, they can be really, really powerful. Because just like we're not wired um, for uncertainty and ambiguity, we're also not wired to take in facts and figures and make sense of it. It's through the story that we start to understand the implications of. And that's a big area of focus of mine at the D School, which is how do we tell more future focused stories? How do we create environments to allow our students to practice the skills they don't yet know they need? That's great. I think I, we have time maybe for, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll take some questions from the Q&A. Um, so I know you both said that you know, the point is not actually articulating a, a particular vision for 2030. Um, we're not here to predict the future. I know I don't like it when people ask you what's gonna be possible for 10, in 10 years from now, but I, but I would like you to sort of, yeah, speculate with us a little bit, right? Like, you know, you've all both been talking about, you know, the kinds of futures that you want and the choices that we can make now to kind of make that future more possible. Um, I guess when, yeah, when you think about the kind of future that you want for biotech, the futures maybe with an S, you know, uh, for biotech in 2030, uh, what is that, right? And and maybe like another part of it's like you know has that changed for you at all in the past couple of months, or you know are are you still like going towards the same future? How, how have the things that are going on now kind of yeah shifted shifted your your vision for that? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I, I I prefer to be in the moderator role where I can ask others a question <laughs> and have to <laughs> attest to it myself. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the, um, the, the recent Senate testimony for me was one exercise in trying to articulate um, some of these futures. And I won't repeat that, but I, I think I have three sort of general hopes for um, what the, the future looks like um, rather than predictions. 
Um, and generally they're in, in three buckets. I would say um, biology for everyone, <laughs> biology with everyone, and um, biology as everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I love what I mean by these three <laughs> is with biology for everyone, it, it means we are well on a trajectory within the next 10 years that recognizes biology's power to solve these big, messy public problems, but not alone, right? We don't just need the technology, we need many different things. And what that means is be, being not complacent in thinking that we have to sort of fit biology with into our existing structures and institutions and markets, um, but being bold and saying, right, if this, is, if this is a powerful technology that's global, that works, that we are made of, that we actually begin to build the new capabilities and the new communities that can advance that vision, that, that are thinking about climate and disease and energy and resilience um, and, and gets past this idea that, that biology will just be normal. Um, we can make it normal and we can have a new normal, right? We're thinking today about a new normal. Um, and so let's use this as a moment to reimagine what our, what our um, uh, capabilities and, and culture with biology really looks like. Um, th the second one is biology with everyone. And we've spoken about this already a lot today, um, that the idea that we will be able to open up many more possibilities when we involve everyone and everyone really does have a stake, right? This is, this is our biology. It's part of what we are made of. And so we have to have um, really a, a citizenry that is capable of being um, informed and literate that isn't taught biology is good, but rather biology is powerful and we have a choice to make. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third one is biology as everyone is kind of getting back at this sense of awe, right? The, the idea that we don't want to just instrumentalize all of biology. It's a recognition and a, and a cultural cognition that we are made of the living world. We are part of it. We have a long history of, um, of changing and interacting with that living world. That's not new, right? It's within a, a broader cultural history of, of shaping our environment. And, and that can be something that is not, again, just used, but something that is part of our culture. And so that comes back to what are the choices we actually have to make <laughs> in, in creating those futures. And, and those, I was a little bit more prescriptive when I was in the Senate saying we should do X, Y, Z. You can read that there. Um, but the, it basically came down to we need bold public investments in this type of technology and the right types of investments that are baking in scholarship on policy and strategic issues alongside the measuring and making of biology. Um, that we need to fundamentally choose collaboration over competition, right? There are massive geopolitical dynamics behind these technologies that we can't ignore, right? There are different points of view and we have different societies and different cultures because of that point of view. But many of those commonalities, because we're made of this technology, we can seize upon and we, we can get a better future by working together. Um, and then the last thing, and I, I hope I don't have to say this, but we've made choices in the past about what we don't use biology for, right? Um, and, and those have been active choices. They haven't always been true. Like biology should not be a weapon, <laughs> right? Because it is the fabric that we are made of. And so that I think underpins all of the choices that, that we are making. So those, so those are big hopes, big, bold ideas, big public investments, a recognition that this is culturally significant and that, um, and that we need to protect against harm. Amazing. I'm so glad I'm following you, Megan. I'm just <laughs> so glad I'm following you. I mean, that was so beautiful. And I really hope that everyone listening takes the, the clip even of the last five minutes and shares it with the rest of their organizations because that was so beautiful and so profound. And I just want to make it a little clip. Uh, how much sure. I love learning with you. That was phenomenal um, because it was a framing. It's a framing of the future and it's a bold vision. And I just want to build on that just a little to say, uh, what is my hope? My hope is that this becomes a foundational thing that we teach at our youngest ages. You know, we talk a lot, and particularly at the D School, about how to close the equality gap through education and how to make design more accessible to all. And part of that includes how do we make uh, the understanding of uh, emerging technologies, you know, accessible to all, that it's not just for the engineers to decide, but it's really for everyone to be a part of. And I'll go back to where I started with, which is 
it's hard to imagine a future where biotech is not a significant part of it. We can't start early enough to help as many people understand that they have to be part of that conversation in shaping it. And my gosh, if you thought that was abstract before, we are living it now. And so my great hope is that the urgency of this moment suggests that this is a time for us to lean in to say, how do we make sure that we mitigate potential futures? As Megan said, where biology can upend us because we, we, we weren't thinking about it imaginatively enough. Uh, or only just a few of us were, you know, how do we actually socialize that? And how do we give more people the sense that they can participate in the conversation, that they can own that power and be a part of it and use it for good? So, so we have to find more ways to get more people involved earlier on. It's one of the many, many reasons why I'm constantly asking Megan about iGen and specifically about when they are going to open up a middle school opportunity. Megan, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. Um, and, and just the last thing I'll say is that it's important to make sure that we're thinking about, you know, the citizenship component. And I'm spending a lot of my time these days, you know, really trying to expand the question about who, who are the kinds of leaders we need to be paying attention to different conversations and what are the, what are the, the literacies uh, that they need to be comfortable with. And, you know, we've already seen uh, it play out when, when certainly in the U.S., when our elected leaders don't really understand basic tech. We have that, right? Basic tech, let alone biotech. So like, what is the opportunity ahead to be thinking about, you know, not, we don't necessarily need leaders that are experts in biotech, but we do need leaders to be learners, more leaders to have the wherewithal to invite Megan to come down and participate in the conversation. And I just want to say, I just, I can't help it. Like Megan's being super humble about what, about her, um, uh, her, her gift <laughs> to the Senate when she, when she shared her vision and, and really helped be a part of the conversation in the future. Like imagine, okay, I just want to take all the viewers here. So, so Megan was a guest in our class. Okay, here we have a class called Inventing the Future, which is all about promoting agency to these uh, young leaders to feel like that they can shape the future um, uh, with the skills that they're building. So we have a class specifically on synth synthetic biology like the next day, Megan goes to DC to testify. The next class we have together, we are showing her testimony to the Senate, which is broadcast live about what does it mean to shape the future. And she is speaking the language that we have been talking about all through class, about the importance of opening up around building community, around supporting leaders. So I hope that that doesn't just happen in our class. I hope that all educators take this opportunity to really say, when we think about they are shaping the future, you are the they. There is no they, we are the they. So that's my hope for the future of Biotech 2030. Thank you so much, this is awesome. Uh, I'll switch to start asking you some questions from the, the Q&A chat. We don't have a ton of time and there are so many good questions, so we won't be able to get to all of them, but maybe what I'm gonna do is sort of blend some questions together because I think uh, I, I think that there they there's synergy here so I think you've both been talking about like educating um, young people and and young scientists and, and all people to be kind of part of this conversation um, there was one question uh, specifically from Sanjeev Nair saying what skills would you like to see young scientists develop especially in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and then I think like a, a, another sort of question that connects to that is is from Jahashua Sharma who asks uh, you know how do about how IGEN teams sort of choose the problems that they're uh, that they're interested in right like you know how do those iGEM teams go about doing that, I guess? And, and, and how can uh, their project choice play a role in influencing the future of biotech? And, and how can we kind of make that, that choice of what they're even, the question they're asking like more prominent, I guess, is, is, is the question. I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's a, the that's a question about sort of education, if we can answer real quick and I can get another one in probably before we wrap up. <laughs> sure, I'll, um, I'll maybe pitch in here. And first, Lisa is far too kind. She's been an incredible inspiration to me and especially along these lines of, of thinking about what is, the, what is the role of education and, and how do you develop different skills and, and mindsets, right? That is many cases not prescriptive 
um, but it's about uh, developing a, a, a posture of learning, right? An attitude towards learning. And, and the idea for that, I think, is baked in in many cases to places like iGEM, right? Where it is not prescriptive. The power is saying, you will have to make a choice about what you spend your life energy on. <laughs> and your responsibility is to make sure that you uh, update that choice <laughs> over time um, and that you don't do it alone. And I think that's one of the big lessons and skills is the idea that you, you can learn how to do these things. But ultimately, uh, responsibility means um, accountability and it means sharing the work. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I see some of the, um, the classes that, that Lisa has given, um, the way that she interacts with these communities. And it's one of, of trust, right? That we trust the, the next generation of leaders to make smart choices. And we don't sort of hide from that. The idea that these are difficult choices, we have to make them, and we have to develop a capacity to not just learn when you're in a class, but learn in everything that you do. Um, and so I think that we've we tried that out. Again, there are lessons about how to do that <laughs> that are sometimes uh, hard, um, but, um, uh, but I think it, it's a very powerful way to go. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. It's, uh, we learn together. I mean, and I just want to pick up on that posture of learning. Um, some of the specific skills are things that we overlook often, like the skill of observation. That's so important. How do we, how do we look without judgment? I mean, I just feel like every day is filled with opportunities to create values if you're willing to pay attention, willing to pay attention. And so can you, can you flex that muscle? And you know what's killing our observation skills? These fancy devices. I mean, we just sit there and we look. We, we literally narrow our field. And what do we need? We need peripheral vision. We need, you know, so, so we need observation. Then we need the practice of asking what my colleague Warren Berger, who wrote a book called A More Beautiful Question, More Beautiful Questions, open-ended, discovery-oriented questions that we don't necessarily know the answer to, but we're curious to find out more about, right? That in and of itself is a teachable skill. Observation, questioning, the ability to bring nascent ideas to life, to visualize them, to share them in a story, to create a narrative around them, also a teachable and learnable skill. So we teach storytelling, we teach visual thinking with stick figures so that we can accelerate the understanding and the learning behind an idea faster. When we just say words to people, we don't know what they're actually hearing. When we visualize our idea, it gives a surface area to actually combine ideas on. The ability to give and receive feedback, not criticism, but productive critique, teachable and learnable skill. I could go on and on. The last one I will say that I feel so strongly about is the ability to design a conversation. Listen, we were not great at designing and convening and hosting conversations in person. Let alone now, we have, as my friend likes to say, this long, thin room, can't really read your signals, I can't understand if you're distracted, if you're mad, if you're curious, if you're angry, if you're worried. All of that emotion is important data. We can't get that. I've been humbled, I've been facilitating conversations for the last nearly 20 years of my career. I am so humbled by how hard it is to do this online. We have a huge, huge opportunity to really lean into facilitation and the conversation skills as not the ones that keep the meeting on time and on schedule, but actually notice the emotion and the flow and the connection in the room so that we can get to a better place together. Amazing, I wish I could, we could be in the same room. <laughs> together and with all all of you that are uh, behind the scenes. Um, I think we, we don't have any more time left. Um, it was such a pleasure to be able to speak with both of you. Thank you so much, Megan and Lisa. Um, I'm going to hand it back now to Kit to kind of close us off and, and uh, introduce our episode for next week. Thanks Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again to all of our panelists, um, or our guests. Uh, Dr. Megan Palmer and Lisa K. Solomon, as well as our moderator, Christina. 
Um, also from the Ginkgo Bioworks team, I would love to say a quick thank you to Leo Campus for all of his IT help. Um, and then on the Faber Futures team, um, thank you to Laura Vent, Joanna Mann, Camille Thierry, Magda um, Bob Malko, Natsai Cheza, and then of course to our graphic designer, uh, Marta Ubers, who if you guys have checked out our Instagram um, or any of our social media posts, you'll see is very, very impressive. Um, we, yeah, so that's very exciting. Uh, but so sign up for next week. Um, if you go to Eventbrite or to ferment.tv, it'll redirect you to next week's episode. Um, and for a preview of that, behind a backdrop of profound uncertainties arising from a post-COVID-19 world, our second installment of Ferment TV stays with the theme of futuring, revealing how prediction and speculation are performative tools that can actually create the future. Our moderator, Natsai Audrey Cheza, will be joined by Lisa White, trend forecaster and director of WGSN Lifestyle and Interiors, and design duo, Elliot Montgomery and Chris Wobkin, co-founders of The Extrapolation Factory, the design research studio for participatory futures. Together, they'll explore how shifting from product to process and from silos to systems can help us imagine and create both alternative and preferable futures. Um, so as I said, please take a look at ferment.tv. Um, and thank you so much to all of you for joining in our very first broadcast. See you next week.